May, I can't thank you enough for being on this podcast. I'm so excited. I genuinely couldn't sleep last night like it was Christmas. Really? I'm such a fan. Yeah, I'm like a huge fan. And I've been listening to the pod since like 2016. No way. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> totally. I'm really excited about your upcoming Netflix stand-up special. Thanks. <laughs> March 28th. It's called Sap. Yeah. It's obviously very personal. And I believe you have a shit ton of important things to say. Thanks. I do understand that the idea of identity must feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, must feel like this external idea almost at this point because people are yearning for understanding. Yeah. I also understand that, of course, you're an intimate person and maybe you like ponies. Yeah. And like cantaloupes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the, all this other shit. That's the flag I'm waving all the time is just like the cantaloupe flag. And also, yeah, that <laughs> identities, it's no more a bigger part of my life than or it should be not a bigger part of my life than anyone's life. But I think because it's such a huge part of this weird culture war right now. And it feels so intense. Then I feel like a responsibility to talk about it. And, you know, yeah. This is like sort of my request, I guess, is to ask you to potentially talk about it because I always strive for, and I think our listeners do too, like strive for the empathetic understanding approach. And by empathy, I don't mean sympathy. I mean the idea of putting oneself in somebody else's shoes and attempting to understand perspective. Mm. So how to frame this question, I was thinking about this, mm. like specific struggle, which usually like the right time for specific struggles are between the ages of like 11, when you start to realize that adults are like fallible, that they're flawed to like 24. Mm. And then there's other struggles to come, but you've shouldered a couple. Yeah. Will you talk about that time frame? Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely someone who's not over my teens. Like I'm obsessed with that time in my life. And I always want to read about people's teens and talk about it. And it's just such a visceral, crazy time. And it was very tumultuous and like developing critical thinking. And then the realization that it's all bullshit and like your parents are flawed and your teachers are like weirdly lonely and, you know. Totally. And for me, it was like a bunch of things happening at once when I was around 13, because it was First of all, the internet arrived in the world, like, I guess it was 1999 or 2000. And so everything changed. Then like gender stuff was happening. So I felt like I was like a really confident kid and androgynous and short hair and really confident. Like I would do a lot of Ace Ventura impersonations at school and people would be into it. Yeah. But, and then all of a sudden everything changes overnight. And I was at an all girls school and I felt like a different species. And, you know, everyone feels that way a bit, I think at puberty, but it felt like really acute. Like I was like, this is not really who I am. Wait, can we explore this for just a second? Do you mind? Mm. How did that break down exactly? Did you feel like you were being more closely examined? Were you not able to like as seamlessly enter into the social structure? Yeah. I mean, the 90s was girl bands and boy bands, right? It was so gendered. And at my school, it was like, you had to know which Spice Girl you were because we were doing lip syncs. You had to know what part of that constellation you were. And I was like, I'm Justin Timberlake. I don't understand. Yeah. But it was confusing because I was really into boys. I don't know. But I was lucky. I had really great parents. And luckily, then I found comedy when I was like 13. I started doing stand up and that was like a real lifesaver. So I think I would have had a really hellish time in high school, which I did at the end. But I found comedy and then started doing drugs as well. So that all happened at once. And drugs were like a kind of trap door out of everything I was feeling in my body. So all that happened at once. It just felt like the world turned upside down. Did school become just like a placeholder then? Totally. Yeah. I was like exhausted at school because I was at comedy clubs like four or five nights a week. And then I dropped out of school when I was like 15 and got kicked out of my house. And so, yeah, it was really chaotic. You jumped into the deep end. Mm. Did you start acting when you were super young? Yeah, but it was theater. I was around a bunch of like cynical old theater actors yeah. that were like, if you can do anything else, kid, you should do it. Oh, okay. But I loved it because school for me was also just miserable and it was really hard for me. I felt like there was a whole other language going on that I just didn't get. Same. 
And then you find this group of adults. It's so intoxicating. Yeah. And they're weirdos and they've been through it. And yeah. And life was larger there. Yeah. It was so much larger than high school. Yeah. I don't even know if I answered your question, but that was kind of what my teens were like. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. It makes sense. But will you tell us about like, you know how we craft our stories? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. And then monetize it. In my case, it's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome, though. It's like profoundly helpful. I hope so. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I fully believe it. I know it. And I knew everything May. <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk a little bit about you getting kicked out of your house? Like your story is that you have had really supportive parents. <laughs> and they haven't, correct me, of course, but they didn't necessarily question your like identity stuff. Like mm. they had, at least from my distant perception, pretty open minds and supportive towards you. Getting kicked out then with that kind of family, that must be fucking hard. Yeah. Yeah, you have to really try. <laughs> um, yeah, they were super open-minded and liberal like when I was a kid. And then, yeah, I think it was just a few years of like really lying a lot and wanting to do drugs. And then they reacted. I think they didn't know what to do. I, I think also... Like 2003, there was a lot of tough love in the zeitgeist and like, you know, Dr. Phil sending people to brat camp and stuff. And that was kind of the, it was like, make your kid hit rock bottom was the kind of vibe. And I think they were so pissed off that I'd been lying and their reaction was to kick me out. But it wasn't like I was having fun, you know? I was so miserable. Wait, will you elaborate on that? Well, I think it probably seemed like I was just partying. But I think now we know about mental health and addiction that often that behavior is like a symptom of an underlying unhappiness. But I think at the time it was just like all about the substances themselves. And yeah. Where did you go? I moved in with a much older man. <laughs> Wait, that seems awfully casual. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's early, you know. Yeah, yeah. no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's intense. Was that a patronizing experience? Well, even older friends at that age, like there's a lot of, oh, you're exactly like I was, you know, or you're this. Let me tell you exactly what you're like. And this is the music that you got to listen to. And there was a lot of that. I learned a lot about the Beatles solo careers. Oh, my God. That's what it was? <laughs> yeah. I yeah. mean, it could have been worse. Yeah. But that's a lot. But all these things are so nuanced because... I'm sure there were benefits, you know, I got off drugs with that guy. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's crazy because I kind of figured out my identity like on stage, kind of. I'm glad there was no YouTube and there's no videos of some weird comedy I was doing. But I got to try on lots of different personalities and kind of go through puberty on stage, which is weird. There is this really specific connection. I love talking to stand-up comics because... There are a few fundamental things that I don't understand. One of them being sort of the addiction to the stand-up. Like the actors that I've worked with that are also stand-ups, that drive, that need for that exchange, that very particular exchange of that kind of performance mm. and getting that kind of reception. Even if you feel completely rejected, it's still like this drive, this pull, like a rock climber or something. Yeah, what is that? Oh, man, I don't know. The adrenaline is really addictive for sure. And I'm not like that anymore, though. I used to have to be out every night. And I love when shows are canceled now. And I feel like I got so much out of my system when I was young. And now I'm like, I think I'm kind of an introverted person. Why did I ever do comedy? You know, that's how I feel a lot of the time. Like if I had an autobiography, it wouldn't be like I was out every night. I think I was more addicted to the green room. And the culture, yeah. the backstage stuff, I love that. And the community, you know, which had a lot of bad apples. It was 2001. It was kind of the Wild West. But totally. also there were amazing people, too, that I'm still our mentors. So it's a real mix. What qualities do you think you inherited from your parents? And I also want to ask you, like, your heavy influences. And I don't necessarily mean that you are malleable at all. Like sometimes a heavy influence can be like, oh, that's not what I want to do. Right. I guess they're connected because my parents were big comedy fans, like huge comedy fans, and got me into Kids in the Hall. And my dad's British, so a lot of like Monty Python and British stuff. 
and Eddie Izzard was big for me. And then I had like scrapbooks that I've recently been looking at from when I was a kid that they're all like female comedic actors, like the SNL cast of the time. Like I was just obsessed with all those people. And did you make these scrapbooks? Big time. Oh my God, constantly. I still kind of have one, but I don't add to it as much. Did you? No, I was not a scrapbooker, but we do have something in common, which is sort of a geographical love. Yes. Yeah. I like a map. I like a globe. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that because I just watched an interview with you that you memorized all the countries in the world, which I love. Yeah. If you could live anywhere for a year, where would you live? Like your study abroad program. I think Iceland or Antarctica or somewhere with a lot of snow. I am interested in what would happen to my brain if it was summer for six months, winter for six months. Yes. I just have always wanted to go there and go nuts and just have a lot of books I'm reading and just like sit and look at the ice, you know? Totally. Yeah. It's a solitary thing. I'm craving nature and solitude. Do you collect anything? Mm, like small brass animal, like little things, little precious magical things. Yeah. Like little miniature ideas. Little like thimbles and marbles and yeah, I just moved to LA so I don't have them with me. They're in London, but I have thousands of little weird things that I feel superstitious about. I do too. I'm, I guess, proud that I'm a curious person. At least I hope I am. I feel like curious people probably wouldn't brag about that. No, they would. They would. Okay. <laughs> Let's say all performance was deemed illegal. Mm. What are your strongest skills to actually make money? I used to work with like nonverbal autistic kids under five. And I loved it so much. I'd do that again. I'd work with little kids. Wow. I think, yeah. What was like, I don't know if you can articulate a takeaway. Well, I think I was also so unqualified. Like now I'm thinking about it. Like I don't have an education at all, but I was dating someone who is an infant mental health specialist. And so we moved to England together and then she had these clients. She was like highly qualified and then they would need extra help. And so I'd work with the families, kind of like a nanny, and doing like behavioral therapy and kind of learned on the job. But I just loved it. It was so fun. I felt like I could get somewhere with those kids and and they were hilarious. And the way they used language was really funny. And one time this kid put his hand up my jeans and he was like feeling my calf. I don't think he'd ever spoken or he'd barely spoken. And then he goes, spiky chicken. <laughs> Like he called my calf like a spiky chicken because I guess I had shaved or something. <laughs> yeah. I was like, yes. That's kind of awesome. That's one example of like a million funny things. They were just great. Have you had a job that you're bad at? So many. Yeah, I worked in a pizza place from 6 p.m. to 4 a.m., like the graveyard shift. In Toronto? Yeah, when I was like 16. And oh man, they had a vegan pizza. And one time I put bacon fat on it. That's so dark. I've never admitted that. Actually, people are going to be really upset about that maybe. But I was I was so young and I was so angry. And I just thought, fuck you. Were you a camp counselor as well? I was. I could talk to you for four hours about camp and camp counselors. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Yes, I love this. So you were a camp counselor. No, I was a camp kid and I worshipped them. And they remain like my pantheon of like gods in my brain. And I'm still friends with them now. I've reconnected with some of them, but like, oh my God. I was like a weird little clown trying to get their attention all the time. And Katie Anderson, the best. She drove the water skiing boat. She wore oh, Oakley sunglasses. God, probably gorgeous and just oh, like the uh, best. Yeah. Yeah. There's like eight to 10 kids that are like pre worshiping you. Yeah. Before you even meet them. Yeah. It, it was <laughs> yeah, incredible. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, they show up and are just like, please save me and help me. You know, I don't know how to live. And you're just like this God. Yeah. You suddenly feel cool. Yeah. Oh, God. And I think I was still wearing braces. Yeah. And headgear. <laughs> Too. People who've had braces, I trust a lot more than people who haven't. I'm like, there's two types of people in this world. I really love that mantra. I had them too, and it was hell. Like they truly used to have like the old timey headgear that I had to wear oh. in eighth grade. Oh my God. <laughs> the worst year, hands down, of your life. That feels like a flashback from Romeo and Michelle. Oh. If you're a business looking to reach millions of engaged podcast listeners around the world, start advertising with ACAST. ACAST is the only place to work with 92,000 exclusive shows, including huge hits like WTF with Mark Marin, Anna Ferris is Unqualified, as well as top publishers, including the BBC and The Economist. ACAST's self-serve ad platform is easy to use, giving you the power to choose your perfect audience, create and launch your campaign, and track your results, all in one place. 
Get your message heard and reach customers wherever they're listening. Visit go.acast.com slash advertise to get started today. But I was already like resigned from like kind of first grade. Like I desperately wanted to be popular, but I knew that it just was not in the cards. <laughs> I was the kid who liked to play imaginary games yeah. for way too long, you know? Totally. Really involved imaginary games. Totally, yeah. Me too. Getting away from the cops. Yes. Like runaways. <laughs> at lunch, like <laughs> me and probably a couple other kids would play like they were the most involved kind of dark soap operas that you're improvising with your friends. Dark plots, crazy involved plots. You must be working some shit out, I think. Yeah, probably what you're working out is like sudden severe instability, especially if you've had like somewhat stable family upbringing. That sudden like shift where it's like, oh, this ground is not solid. Totally. Like you start to realize like, oh, authority is like not that credible. Yeah. You're like peeling back the wallpaper on reality. It's like the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Who's behind the curtain. Yeah. When we would play house and I was always this character, Zach, who was like the rebellious teenage son. And I was always on a motorcycle and the storylines were like, I'd get someone pregnant. Like it was crazy. And he was such a rebel and always like leaving town. Oh, but you're not going to raise the baby, Zach. <laughs> no, I'd be like, I'm out of here. Zach. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. It was brutal. <laughs> oh, Zach's so irresponsible. <laughs> I'm smoking a twig, you know? Yeah. Oh. I love that because I had to play multiple roles. I was always oldest sister and then I was always the boyfriend and then like the creepy truck driver. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everyone else, like all the <laughs> other neighbors, they were just bystanders. They were all like much younger than I was too. <laughs> and you were just doing like a, a one woman <laughs> show basically. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> okay. May, how old were you when you first felt like you were in love? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I always thought I was in love all the time. Probably this guy, Ian Peach, when I was 13. And our song was Don't Want to Miss a Thing by Aerosmith. And we would slow dance to it. And he got a semi. Wait a minute. So this is like at 13. I did not have a, I mean, I had crushes all my life. Like I was born with a crush. Yeah. You're like that doctor's hot <laughs> as you came out of the womb. Totally. <laughs> I was obsessed with boys and then dated Ian Peach and then he broke up with me on speakerphone while all of his friends listened. No. Yeah, it was brutal. It was so unnecessarily cruel. But then I got over it fast because we weren't really in love and then started dating girls and men when I was like 15, 16. Were they all older? Not the girls. Oh, that's interesting. Were they your age? Yeah, I had girlfriends my age that I treated pretty badly, I think, looking back because I was going through stuff dating older men secretly. But like the duality, the idea of like, this is the thing I can control. And then this is like the thing. It's chaos. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that was it. But I guess that was the first time I was in love was with that guy I lived with because it felt like a sort of domestic adult life. Looking back, that's not what it should be either. But my first like healthy relation was probably when I was like 20. I met this very nice woman. We're still friends. We got engaged. Five years we're together. Moved to England. What happened? I mean, I'm always interested in breakup because they are like the scars. Yeah. I don't believe in the idea of closure. No, me neither. <laughs> it feels fruitless. It feels ridiculous. And these are the events that have happened in our lives. Yeah. And they fade. There's comfort in that. And hopefully they make us more empathetic people and like the journey of risk taking. But will you tell us a little bit about? Well, actually, the engagement breakup was pretty healthy. Like we kind of wanted to live in different countries and our lives were going in different directions. And that was pretty healthy. And we're still really good friends. The thing with dating older people when you're younger is it's never really a real because it's always secret or there's some. So you, you never really get to grieve it like a relationship because you've never really been allowed to call it that. You know, I almost called into your podcast when I was going through a breakup. May. Can you imagine if I did? Yeah, I would have been floored and I would have loved that. <laughs> Let's go back then. Yeah, I was like living in England. I was 28 maybe and... I was dating someone for three and a half years who wouldn't come out, this woman, and we lived together and everyone knew, but she was like, nobody knows, we can't. And so it was like waiting for the bus to come because she'd be like, oh, I'm going to tell people like next week for three and a half years. And I would listen to your podcast and I think someone called in with a similar thing. And yeah. I was like, I should call in. And then <laughs> I'm so glad I didn't in a way. 
Because then I'd be here now being like... We have had a few callers that have talked about that issue. And it is such a specific kind of loneliness and rejection in that world. Oh, you internalize it so much. Yeah. Yeah. And you want to be patient and understanding. And then at a certain point, you're like, this is not good for me. But it is a weird one. That just makes my day (laughs) that you wanted to call in. I really vividly remember being like, that would be really kind of validating right now to call in. But yeah, it is just like waiting for a bus to come. You're like, surely they will at some point tell someone. And it never happened. Well, it'd be like you tell one person and then that tides you over for like a month and you tell another. But also it's like, what was I doing? Why was I in that for so long? Uh, Listen, I think that like the 20s are just built for chaos. Yeah. You make these rules within your relationship and it becomes this little world with its own logic of like, yeah, this is normal and makes sense because this is just what our relationship is. Completely. Yeah. And then you get out of it. You're like, oh, no one does that. Like that weird dynamic we had is not. Yeah. Are you in the middle of doing press and how are you feeling? Oh, I'm fine. I've been doing only fun, nice things so far. Good. Well, that's all you deserve. Thanks. (laughs) And then I want to know your early impressions of LA. Like, are you a stranger in a strange land? How do you feel? Mm, I'm in the honeymoon period because I was in England for 12 years. I think if I was in my 20s, I'd be not enjoying it, but I'm pretty mellow. I'm having fun. Good, good. It's a nice change. Yeah, it's a great change. For me, like the idea of home has been like whatever the feeling that is the antithesis of homesickness. Mm. And LA never landed on that. Mm. But it provided like a soothing balm for a long time. Yeah. My body was like absorbing vitamin D. It felt exciting. That's where I'm at. I don't know if it'll feel like home ever, but I was in England for 12 years. No sun. So it's nice. I like the fake positivity in LA. Even if it's fake, I'm like, give it to me. Me too. When I went back to Seattle after I moved to Los Angeles and like the hometown bar people would be like, how can you stand all those fake people down there? And I was like, they may be fake, but they're happy. Yeah. Are you guys real and just mean? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'll take fake and happy. It's made me feel pretty good so far. If you're serious about podcasting, Acast is serious about getting you paid. With millions of dollars paid to our podcasters, we're the best in the business in helping you make money from your craft on your terms. From ads and sponsorship by the world's biggest brands to getting paid directly by listeners through Acast Plus with subscriptions and one-time purchases, Acast offers more ways to earn revenue than any other platform. Join Acast with a three-month trial of our paid plan using the code JOIN. Just visit go.acast.com slash join. Alexandria. Hi. Hi. Alexandria, I am here with May, Martin, and they are awesome. And we're really excited to be talking to you. Will you tell us what's going on? Yes. So I've been single for about a year now. So I decided like maybe this is time to jump in the dating scene. And I found that like hookup culture is like really common. And it's hard to find somebody that wants to like think about something serious and lean towards more of like a long term relationship. And they're mostly looking for just a quick hookup or a friends with benefits or a situationship kind of thing. So like, I'm just wondering how to find something serious in a time where hookup culture is more common. Okay. If you don't mind, how long was your last relationship? My last relationship was over a year. (laughs) Heartbreak hard? Yes. It was um, my first long-term relationship, like as an adult. And it was a little rough after that. And it took a lot of healing. But it was a long distance kind of a thing. So it was better for the both of us in the long run. And can I ask when you're dating now, is this like on apps or what's your main? So I've tried like the apps. I've tried reaching out to people on social media or like just walking up to a person like when I see them, like, hi, like, it's nice to meet you. That's cool. Yeah, it's been difficult. It's so difficult, but I think apps get a bad rep. But one thing that came into my mind is if you know specifically what you're looking for, then a good way to weed people out is to put that in your bio on the app. You know, I'm looking for something 
for a real connection. Yeah, I tried Hinge because I've heard like Tinder is more of a hookup thing. So I tried Hinge for a little while and I like put that I want like a long term relationship. And I was still getting people that were like, oh, let's hang out. Or it would be going really well. And then I would get like one of those late night texts, like, what are you doing? And I'm like, this is what I was not looking for. And it's kind of disappointing because people will even say like, this is what I want as well. And then it ends up turning into something different. And then it's kind of like, well, I don't know if I want to do this now. I'm a lot younger too. So I feel like it's harder because most people my age are in college. And so they're mostly like trying to have fun. And I get that, but I'm done with school now. How old are you? If you don't mind me asking. I'm 20. Okay. My instinct is whenever I've had this energy of like, I really want to find someone, it sometimes acts as a weird, like it repels it in a way. And I feel like sometimes focusing on your life and your friendships and your hobbies and your interests and really focusing on that, then you're going to be meeting all these people with similar interests. You're going to form friendships so that you know people first and what they're looking for. And then those could evolve into something. Yeah, that made sense. Alexandria, I'm a relationship person. It's just the shoe that fits for me. My dating experience is so minimal. I guess I kind of wonder about the why now. And this is truly just a question. Are you subconsciously dismissive? So I have a therapist and me and her have been working on me, like getting up to the point where I'm ready. Because with my last relationship, it was almost like a traumatizing effect on me afterwards, just because when your heart breaks, you know, it's a little bit harder. And I do tend to push people away a little bit just because I am scared of being hurt again. But I've tried to be more open and just trying to tell myself, like, it's okay. The worst somebody can say is no, you know, and just get rid of like that fear of the rejection and the fear of the pain. So like, I feel like I'm ready now at this point. And like, I'll talk to my friends about it and they're all feeling like the same way. Like, it's very odd. Like, I don't know. Hmm. You mean they're feeling the same way about you or they're feeling the same way in their own lives? In their own lives with like relationships. Yes. Hmm. Okay. I really feel like after quarantine, like the last two years, people have been putting a lot of pressure on themselves to make big decisions, to get the shit figured out, to like get back on that horse, to move across the country, to get married, to get divorced, to do the thing. And I feel it because a lot of our callers speak about this. Like, I'm ready. Like, what you're feeling. And if you had a long breakup and a long-distance relationship, your heart is that little grain of sand in an oyster. Mm. So it is simply food for thought. How many dates have you been out on? I've been on three, like, actual dates. And most of the time, it doesn't really get to that point because I don't ever get like a, do you want to go out to dinner? Or like, is there an activity that you want to do? Do you want to grab coffee? It's more like, let's hang out at my house. And I'm like, well, I don't really want to go to your house or have you at mine because I don't want it to just be a short-lived little fling. Like physical intimacy to me is important, yes, but I want an emotional connection with somebody before we get to that point, just because I feel like it goes a lot smoother and you also get to know the person. You're not rushing into anything. I want something that happens organically. It's not like, let's get this done and over with. Totally. I think that's cool. I do too. But also, I mean, if the breakup was a year ago, it probably took you a long time to feel okay. And you're just now starting to feel okay. I really would take the pressure off this part of your life a little bit and of yourself because that sense of urgency, like you don't want to end up rushing into something with the wrong person just because you're looking for that stability and yeah. you don't need it. You know, you seem amazing. And yeah, thank you. If you put that same energy into the other areas of your life, it's going to feel so full. And I have no doubt you're going to find someone who wants a similar thing. Three dates is, you know, it's going to happen. And also you don't want to be going in with this energy of like, this better be a long-term thing because you have to find out first, regardless of physical intimacy, which you know how you feel about that and you should stick with it. But like, you might have to ease in with some people, like, just go get coffee, get to know them without being like, what are you looking for? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like, instead of them answering your questions, you can ask them the question. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yes. It's sort of a broad idea. But like, listen, there's a world full of ding-dongs that are bound to disappoint you. But that aside, I think that if you are content being single— I truly keep hearing this feeling of like, let's get this figured out. Mm -hmm. Why are they all like this? Where can I find that one that's not? And that is too much pressure. And I don't think the world kind of delivers like that. I think it's a patience and trying things out. 
I totally think you should continue using the dating apps if you are looking, but I think you maybe need to engage yourself a little more. It feels to me, and I don't know if this is true, that you're playing defense and there's a way to play offense. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Letting people come to you once they see how full your life is and that you're happy and busy. And once they come to you, you can vet them. Right. Yeah. Because you've also self-defined, as I have in the past, as somebody with guard up. I've been hurt and I don't want to be hurt again. So therefore, constantly watching for the red flags. And I don't know if it's the most productive and the most fulfilling for you yeah for who you are to lead these dates you know what I mean like lead with you you are awesome and will you be hurt again probably yeah and you'll hurt someone yeah and you'll hurt someone so being proactive as opposed to being reactive and you know if a guy texts you in the middle of the night like what are you doing you can say, not fucking you, but what are you up to? <laughs> yeah. You can be like, well, I got my mouth guard in and I'm yeah, watching totally, reality totally. TV. Yes. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because even if he doesn't text you back, who cares? At least it's like you making yourself smile. Yeah. But also, yeah, be vigilant about how much of your day you're spending thinking about this or talking about, it, you know, on the apps or like thinking about your checklist of what you need in a person. Because often that can create such an impenetrable... Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you got so much else going on as well that's super fun. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. And now is the time to travel. That is the best advice I feel like yeah. I can give to anybody. Like they're trying to make these large decisions that we put off for a long time. We got to figure it out. Even if it's a small road trip, even if it's like experiencing something new, we have experiencing and ruminating over the same ideas for a long time. We've had that luxurious and anxious space and time to do that along with tragedy the whole combination but i want you to know that you're not alone you know it feels like everyone right now is in this small degree of panic mm. and i think that it just requires a beat but also have fun you know like, yeah i do also hear about this generation that people are staying in more which understandably pandemic but get out run around yeah. thank you like make some bad choices you know yeah yes <laughs> yes yeah. yeah yeah you've got like a whole decade 20 to 30 uh do it Go up. Nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. thank you guys so much i appreciate it all thank you thank you alexandria have a wonderful day thank you guys you too bye Do you know that so many people on Twitter have tweeted at me in the past 10 years that we look the same? Have you ever got this? I'm so flattered. I get so many tweets that are like, have the same face structure. I am so <laughs> flattered because you are gorgeous. Ditto. <laughs> I'm just really grateful to have spent this time with you and I would love it if you would be in my life somehow. Oh man, that'd be amazing. Truly, this has been like some kind of weird friendship kismet honor for me. Ditto. I can't thank you enough. It's surreal for me being in the pod that I've listened to for so long. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honor. Bye, mate. Bye. Bye.